I will now introduce our first speaker. Dr. Paul Conrad received his PhD in 2011 from the University of Texas at Austin and is currently an associate professor of history at UT Arlington. He, his research focuses on indigenous people's confrontations with colonialism in North America, with particular interest in questions of captivity, forced migration, and enslavement. His recent book, The Apache Diaspora, Four Centuries of Displacement and Survival, was published last year by University of Texas Press, and he will be speaking about mobility, conflict, and persistence, Apaches, and Texas history. Please help me in welcoming Professor Conrad. Good morning, everyone. All right, it sounds like you can hear me okay. I'm not used to being on a stage with a mic and uh, lights blaring. <laughs> so I, I wanna thank the organizers of this symposium for inviting me, um, and I wanna thank all of you for being here on this Saturday morning to, uh, to learn more about, about history. So I'm gonna be introducing our theme of frontiers in Texas history uh, by focusing on Native American history and Apache history more specifically. Um, but to get us started, um, I wanted to actually check in with you um, to see what you know already. Um, you didn't know that you were going to be quizzed this morning. <laughs> the good news is you can cheat off a neighbor. Um, so um, what I'd like you to do is pair up with someone nearby you um, and discuss these questions and see if you can come up with an answer. For some of you, this may be easy. Uh, you may know all of these uh, answers already. For some of you, it may be more challenging. It's okay, whichever camp you're in. Um, but I'll give you a minute or two to talk about these, um, and then we're going to come back together to talk about uh, the correct answers um, as a way of introducing the subject matter of my talk today. All right, get to work. All right, I hear some good discussion, but I'm going to go ahead and interrupt in the interest of time and see what you guys were able uh, to come up with here. Um, so with question number one, the American Indian and Alaska Native population in Texas in 2020, uh, this is based on the U.S. Census, the recent U.S. Census. Um, how, just by show of hands, how many of you thought 6,000? A. Okay. 44,000? 278,000? 135,000? All right. I think 135,000, it seemed like had the most, but you're a mixed, it was a mixed bag. <laughs> um, uh, all right. Um, I'll tell you the correct answer in a minute, but let's go on to number two. Uh, <laughs> a percentage of the population living in urban areas, 20%? Any takers? 40%? 60%? 80%? Not many for 80. All right. Um, question three, federally recognized tribes in Texas, uh, zero. You're a smart group here. Uh, eight, three, ah, knowledgeable audience. Uh, ten, all right. Um, and then the last question was percentage change in the native population, 35%, uh, 7%, negative 1.6, okay, and 63%. All right, no, not many takers for that. All right, so these are the correct answers. Um, well, let's start with the, the you know, population questions. Um, so uh, this is uh, the number of people who identify as American Indian or Alaska Native alone, meaning they're not, uh, they're not checking more than one box. Um, so that number is 278,000. Um, and uh, the point here is that there's a significant native population in Texas to this day. Um, and sometimes I think when we talk about Texas history, native history gets framed as being a part of the 19th century or earlier past. Um, but one of the themes I wanna uh, address today in my talk is this, this issue of persistence um, and even resurgence of native populations. Um, uh, skipping ahead to number four, um, this 63% this increase um, is really surprising to some people. Um, when I ask a less knowledgeable audience than you all, um, such as uh, my undergraduate students, <laughs> they usually pick the negative number. 
Um, and I think uh, often non-natives in U.S. society have a sense that native populations are smaller than they actually are, and they often have a sense that native cultures are decreasing or, or declining. Um, so that, that very large number is, is sometimes surprising to people. Um, now, uh, the reasons for that big increase are complicated. Um, it has a lot to do with changes in how people self-identify. Um, so we have a large number of people who in the past didn't identify as solely American Indian, but are now, um, or um, who um, didn't identify as being multiracial, but are now identifying as such. Um, if we open up, uh, kind of open this up to that category, people who identify as American Indian and white, or American Indian and black, um, the increase in Texas was actually uh, more than 120%. Um, so we have a lot of people that are shifting to, um, their, their identifications um, in the census. Um, uh, where, do, where does the native population live? This is surprising to some people that uh, more than 80% live in, in urban areas. Um, the native population, like the U.S. population more generally, um, is quite urban. And native people are living in places like Austin and Dallas. Um, uh, Los Angeles um, and, and elsewhere. Um, this in part owes to U.S. government policies over time that, that sought to encourage Native people to leave reservations and move into cities. And that's affected Texas history as well. Uh, federally recognized tribes, um, I sometimes get this question, are there reservations in Texas? Um, are there Native communities, uh, uh, federally recognized tribes still in Texas? And you guys were very good on this one. There's three. Uh, the uh, Alabama Cushada, the Kickapoo, uh, and the Isleta del Sur Pueblo over uh, in El Paso. Um, all right, um, so <laughs> with this background in mind, um, I want to move into the subject of my talk today. And what I want to do today um, is ground our discussion of frontier encounters in Texas in Native American history. Um, after all, the history of the place we now call Texas has long been shaped by Native American peoples, not just in the distant past, um, but into the present. These landscapes, many of us call home, were Native lands long before Spaniards, Mexicans, or Americans set foot on them. The first frontiers, the first meeting grounds or dividing lines between people of different cultural backgrounds, were not Spanish frontiers or Mexican frontiers or American frontiers, um, but rather Native American frontiers. Frontiers between Karankawas and Kowiltekans, between Wichitas and Caddo's, between Humanos and Apaches. Colonialism threatened the indigenous presence in Texas over time. Um, in fact, by 1900, the U.S. Census counted only 470 Native Americans remaining in Texas. But that was not the end of the story. Owing in part to new migrations of Native Americans into the state after World War II, um, there are now more than 250,000 who identify as American Indian alone in Texas with a much larger number, uh, more than 750,000 identifying as American Indian in combination with another category. And as we saw, there are still federally recognized tribes headquartered in Texas. So what does a focus on Native American history over the long term, from the pre-colonial past to the present, teach us about frontier encounters and Texas history? It would be a daunting task and take far too long to try to discuss every native group whose history has influenced Texas. And so uh, to make my case today, I'm going to focus on examples drawn from the history I'm most familiar with from my own research, the history of Apache peoples. So there's two key questions I want to address with you in the time uh, I have left today. Um, the first is about what lessons we can learn about Texas um, and the history of frontiers in Texas uh, from a focus on Apache history? What, what do Apache histories tell us about this, this place and this theme? And then the second question that I'm gonna turn to in conclusion is to think about how Texas history, how the story of Native Americans and frontiers in Texas compares to other places. How unique or distinctive is the story of Texas um, if we place it into a broader context? All right, 
Um, to start, I want to just briefly introduce Apaches. Um, so for some of you, um, Apache, if, if I say Apache history, you probably think of, of narratives of resistance, uh, stories of uh, Apaches like Cochise and Geronimo. Um, and certainly that's an important part of Apache history in the 19th century, um, that narrative of, of resistance. Um, but Apache history is, is more complex than that um, and more interesting, I think. Um, uh, one thing to know is that uh, there was not one Apache nation or tribe, uh, historically or in the present. Uh, there were multiple Apache groups that shared an ancestral language. They shared certain cultural and religious practices. Um, they sometimes uh, allied with each other based on shared interests um, uh, and also uh, kinship, relationships across tribes. Um, uh, but their sense of of identity, their sense of who they needed to be loyal to, uh, was often fairly, fairly localized. Today, owing to histories of colonization and forced migration, Apache nations are headquartered in Arizona, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Texas, and Louisiana. Uh, and Apaches in that way uh, illustrate a broader theme in Native American history of uh, having been affected by, by forced migrations. So this map here is, is incomplete. Um, there are Apache nations missing from the map, uh, like the Yavapai Apache Nation, um, the Choctaw Apache community of Ebarb in Louisiana, um, the Fort Sill um, Apache tribe is, you see a little dot there in Oklahoma, but it's kind of cut off the map a little bit. Um, anyway, the point here is to give you a sense of where Apache territories were historically and where they are today. Of course, the Lipan Apache are also missing from this map, which is very um, important for Texas. Um, so uh, with this introduction to Apaches and Apache history in mind, um, I wanna move to the first lesson that I think Apache history can teach us about frontiers and Texas history. And that is that frontiers don't begin with Anglo-Americans moving west. Um, they don't begin with shipwrecked Spaniards, um, they begin um, before Europeans. And maps can help us see this. There's been a lot of effort recently to do a better job of mapping Native American history and mapping uh, Native American communities. Um, you may have seen maps like this uh, representing kind of tribal homelands um, uh, in the Americas. Um, this is a, a close-up of um, one of these maps that is portraying indigenous communities um, in, in Texas. Um, and I think these, these maps are really useful um, in getting people to kind of reorient their perspectives and remember that this landscape, the Americas, was full of indigenous peoples before Europeans came in. These peoples had their own territories, their own borders and boundaries in some cases, um, their own conflicts um, with each other. Um, there are, of course, also problems with maps. I know there's a lot of experts in mapping in the room today, um, but it's one of the things that's difficult to do in maps is to represent change over time, right? Um, so um, uh, the reality, of course, is that some of the groups portrayed um, in, on this map entered into Texas from elsewhere. Um, some then uh, were forced out of or chose to migrate out of Texas um, later. Um, so that dynamic history of movement um, and uh, conflict and um, change over time and territories is something that these maps um, don't always do a good job um, of portraying. Um, in large part because of issues of evidence of the, of the documents um, and historical maps we prefer to use to be able to narrate the past, the Native American history of Texas and the Southwest has tended to focus on the 16th century and after. Um, though there have recently been efforts to change this by uh, drawing upon archeology span and merging archeology span and history, it remains the case that too often our histories of regions like Texas begin with the arrival of Europeans and their pens, their record keeping traditions. But Apache history beckons us to think about Native American explorers, um, about the creation of frontiers of interaction, cooperation, and conflict between Native American groups um, even before Europeans arrived. Um, let me give you a couple of examples quickly um, of that. Um, the first um, example that comes to my mind of 
uh, Apache frontiers with other Native American groups, uh, is drawn from the borderlands of what's now Texas and New Mexico. Um, so uh, sometimes uh, in, in, um, in the histories, Apaches often appear as kind of a threatening presence. Um, there's a lot of discussion of Apache raiding um, in historical scholarship. Um, but this wasn't always the case, and, uh, including fr um, from the vantage point of other native groups. Uh, the uh, Apache presence was sometimes welcomed. So if we look at particular Pueblo communities um, in New Mexico um, and their relationship with Plains Apaches, whose homelands included areas of Texas, um, Colorado, Kansas, we see that they often had relationships of cooperation um, and mutual aid. Apaches drawing upon their dogs in this period before European settlement. Dogs were the beasts of burden. Um, something to wrap our minds around. <laughs> Thinking of my own dog being able to haul anything. Uh, but Apaches' dogs uh, hauled in hides, meat, tallow, salt, um, in order to trade with Pueblo communities who offered in exchange blankets, pottery, maize, corn, um, and turquoise. We also see um, examples, um, including stretching into the historical pe uh, period, um, the uh, period of European colonization, um, of Apache and Pueblo people cooperating in times of crisis. Um, so um, during times of drought um, or uh, periods of political turmoil and violence, we see examples of Pueblo people moving into Apache communities and living among the Apache. Uh, we see examples of Apaches then settling near Pueblos, um, uh, their Pueblo allies, um, to gain protection um, during times um, of, of war. Um, so these practices of refuge, asylum, um, um, in addition to raiding and captive taking and trading, um, all of these types of interactions predated the Spanish, the Mexicans, the Anglos. Colonialism helped create new frontiers between Native American groups as well. Um, some of you are likely familiar with the story of the Comanches um, and their migrations into what we now call Texas. Um, if we shift perspective and view um, Comanche history from an Apache perspective, we can see that some of the greatest threats um, that Native communities faced in the 18th century were sometimes from other Native groups, um, which led, um, in the case of Apache history, Jicarillas, Mescaleros, Lipans, uh, to engage with and cooperate with Europeans, with Spanish settlements in new ways in order to try to seek safety and survival um, from Comanches. Uh, the presence of uh, Lipan and Mescalero Apaches um, in other areas in the Texas borderlands um, also um, you know, illustrates this dimension of, of frontiers between native groups um, and also the fact that Apaches weren't always viewed as threatening um, or menacing. Um, so uh, at La Junta, for example, the missions um, at La Junta, uh, we see really interesting evidence of relationships between mission Indians and um, Apaches. Um, one of my favorite um, quotes in all of my research uh, was this friar. Um, there's a, an expedition to the Junta missions in the 1740s um, in which, you know, the, um, the, fri uh, the friars are interviewed about, you know, what's going on with these missions? How are things going? Um, and the friar complains, you know, these natives, the mission Indians, they hear mass when it suits them. They pray when they want to. But most of the time, what they do is go around on horseback trading with the Apaches. Um, so <laughs> they, uh, it was a very frustrating job to be a, a missionary uh, in, in Texas uh, at this, uh, this time. Uh, I think what this shows, too, is that some of the frontiers of Texas were multi-sided frontiers. And what I mean by that is we sometimes talk about, you know, Spanish native relations or Spanish Mexican or Mexican Indian relations. Um, but at places like La Junta, what we see is really a more complicated and interesting dynamic of relations between the Spanish natives and other natives <laughs> um, that uh, created a really interesting um, environment um, in this time period. When Anglo-Americans began migrating west into Texas in the early 19th century, new frontiers of conflict um, and cooperation formed. Um, these were merely the latest developments in a much longer history in which frontiers had as often been between native groups as between natives and Europeans. <clears throat> 
And this brings me to my second lesson that Apache history in Texas can teach us about frontiers and Texas history. And that is that while migration, violence, cooperation, trade, frontiers, all of these dynamics of human history predated colonialism, the arrival of Europeans did spark a new era, a new degree um, of violence um, and new forms of captivity and forced migration. Um, and this, uh, in large part, I would say, had to do uh, with, um, with two main factors. So one is technology. Um, so even though there were sometimes relatively small populations of Europeans, um, the horses and firearms that they brought with them were then employed by Native American groups like the Comanche um, in pursuing their own interests and in some cases their own conflicts uh, with their neighbors. Um, another key reason why uh, colonialism ushered in a new era of violence was the expansiveness of empire itself. Um, so though there might be relatively few Spaniards or Mexicans or even later Anglo-Americans in Texas, um, those individuals were linked to imperial networks um, that tied them to larger centers of population and manufacturing. One of the ways we can see this is, um, an analogy I would give is, you know, Lipan Apaches did take Spanish people captive, right? Um, but they generally didn't um, send them on deadly marches to be incarcerated in jails in distant urban centers or send them across the sea to Caribbean islands. Um, but the Spanish, Mexican, and Americans did do those kinds of things, drawing upon their expansive imperial networks. Um, so while native enemies had long taken captives from each other, the colonial presence, colonial governance, um, concerns about security, and also colonial labor demands combined um, uh, with new, these new technologies that colonists brought with them uh, to pose new threats uh, to native communities. So in New Mexico, um, to stretch beyond uh, Texas just for a minute, in New Mexico, Apaches uh, were cast um, by the Spanish as enemies of the crown. Um, Despite legal prohibitions against slavery, they were generally, it was generally accepted that they were enslavable because of their resistance uh, to the Spanish crown. And so we see hundreds of Apache people uh, being transported out of New Mexico and its surroundings, uh, well, into New Mexico and Spanish society in New Mexico as well, but also then out of New Mexico um, and shipped south um, to places like the mining centers in New Spain. Uh, one of the especially useful sources for understanding that is Catholic church records. Some of you have done work, a lot of work in Catholic church records here in Texas, um, uh, in New Spain, in the Catholic church records of New Spain, uh, we see um, uh, many native people who uh, had been um, brought, uh, shipped away from their homelands and transported south to labor. Um, this is the baptism of a, of a boy named Matias um, you can see there, you might be able to make out there on the left under the number four, Matias Indio. Uh, and we see um, he, uh, in the record, it explains he's the son um, of Magdalena India Apache Soltera, um, an unmarried Apache Indian woman. Uh, one of the interesting things about these church records is they show us um, some of the relationships uh, that existed um, uh, 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 among um, the captive and exploited people shipped away from Texas and other areas in the Southwest. Uh, we see that uh, this boy's godparents um, were uh, Diego, an Apache man, and Maria, a black slave woman. Um, in Texas, Spanish officials were at the forefront of experimenting with new methods to try and instill fear in and control native populations, including through forced migration and, um, or deportation schemes. Um, so in the 18th century, we see uh, the Spanish often dreamed, kind of envisioned uh, shipping various native groups out of Texas as a means of finally subjugating and controlling them. Often these were really just fantasies because they didn't have the power to actually put these schemes into practice. Um, but we do see some examples of this actually taking place, such as when uh, the Apache um, leader Cabellos Colorados and his family were deported from San Antonio. Um, and later, um, in the 18th century um, and early 19th century, the Spanish put this practice into place more broadly. 
um, all across uh, the nor their northern frontier, all across what is now the U.S. Southwest. Native people, especially Apache peoples, were targeted for forced migration, and several thousand um, were shipped south from the Southwest um, to Mexico City, to Veracruz along the coast, um, uh, and then um, some of them were shipped on to Cuba um, as well. Every tribe had its trail of tears. Um, this is a quote from the Lumbee activist and writer Helen Shirebeck. Uh, there's a lot of truth to that, as we can see, uh, for Native Americans in general, for Apaches, um, and also for, for Natives um, in Texas. Um, and Native trails of tears um, escalated further after the U.S. annexation of Texas. Um, U.S. expansion not only um, displaced uh, Native Americans, including um, Cherokees and Kickapoos and others, to Texas. So there's uh, these natives that come to Texas because they're being displaced from elsewhere. Um, um, but also, ultimately, U.S. Um, uh, settlement and annexation of Texas led to the forced removal of most of the existing indigenous peoples of Texas. This is why groups like the Caddo Nation, the Wichita and affiliated tribes, the Tonkawa, the Comanche, all still exist, but their uh, tribal headquarters are now um, in, in Oklahoma. Um, there's this remarkable map, at least to me, of uh, kind of the origins of Oklahoma tribes, um, showing kind of where they came from. Uh, many of them, of course, force, forced uh, to what was originally called Indian Territory um, from all across the continent. And that includes many, many uh, tribes originally in Texas. Now, I'm uh, Running out of time, um, so I want to uh, lead us to the third lesson that I think um, Apache history and Native American history of Texas can teach us about frontiers in this place. And this lesson has to do with Native persistence and resurgence. And this ties back to the quiz uh, at the outset in terms of thinking about the continued Native presence um, to, to this day. Um, in Texas specifically, Lipan Apaches, uh, in the 19th century had sought survival, in some cases by assisting the U.S. in campaigns against other natives. Uh, they, many had then fled into Mexico. Um, some were ultimately returned from Mexico to the U.S. as refugees. Um, a few joined the Tonkawa and in Indian Territory. Um, others joined the Mescalero Apache Reservation in New Mexico in the early 1900s. Later in the 20th century and, and forward to the present, there would also be a resurgence of Lapan Apache and other native communities here in Texas. Um, some Lapan uh, Apaches today, uh, members of the Lapan Apache Band of Texas and Lapan Apache Tribe of Texas, are descendants of those um, who had remained on their lands, who had gone underground, hid in plain sight, uh, in some cases been labeled Hispanic, even as they retain knowledge of native identity. Um, others um, are descendants of Apache captives carried across the Southwest and into Mexico whose stories of their Lipan identity had persisted, survived, or been recovered. Um, Lipan Apache, the Lipan Apache tribe was recognized as it's a state recognized tribe here in Texas, recognized in 2009 and then again in 2019, though they're still seeking federal recognition. More broadly, the last half of the 20th century would see a resurgence of Native American communities in Texas more broadly. Um, in the mid-20th century after World War II, there was this Indian relocation program. The U.S. was trying to get Native people to leave reservations and settle in cities. Um, and a significant number, um, I think it's around 40,000, settled in the Dallas area um, as a result of that program. Uh, this is a flyer for the Indian Relocation Program. Uh, it's not for, for Dallas, it's for Denver, <laughs> but it can give you a sense of kind of the advertising uh, that the U.S. was engaged in to try to get Native people um, to move to cities. Come to Denver, the chance of the lifetime, this flyer says, and there were similar, similar flyers for places like Dallas. Um, there also continue to be... Uh, other kinds of frontiers um, here um, in Texas. Um, so frontier conflict of a sense continues. Um, uh, this, this slide shows um, Eloise Tamez, uh, Lipan Apache, um, who um, challenged a border wall running through her family's uh, lands um, here um, in Texas. Um, so these kind of uh, frontiers, uh, whether of conflict or cooperation, uh, continue to be influential in Texas. Um, even to this day. 
All right, in conclu and to conclude, I want to briefly address this question of how unique this all is. Um, so how unique is the story of Native Americans and frontiers in Texas um, as viewed from my focus on Apache history? Some of you may know that Texas has a long tradition of viewing itself as an exceptional place. Uh, everything is bigger here, et cetera. <laughs> um, but while often cast as a unique or extraordinary place, um, I see te te Texas as a very interesting place that is in many ways more typical than exceptional in terms of its frontier history. It's history you know, of cross-cultural interaction and conflict. Um, it has long been a complex, contested place, influenced by migrations and forced migrations, um, a place impacted by the efforts of multiple peoples to make home for themselves in places where other people were already living. While the frontier stories we are going to be hearing from other panelists throughout the day today are Texas stories, I would offer in conclusion that they are not just Texan stories, uh, but also American stories and ultimately human stories with broad implications. Thank you. Testa. If anybody has any questions, I'll be right over with the microphone. If you have any questions, I have a microphone. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit, so in the Apache diaspora, um, in places like Mexico and Cuba where they were sent on these forced deportations, are, is there a resurgence of Apache identity specifically in those kind of places as well? That's a great question. So the question is about, you know, with Apaches sent far from their homelands into into Mexico to the Caribbean. Um, did you know? Is, is there a resurgence of Apache identity in those places today? Um, we're seeing a little bit of that. Um, so um, the first thing I would say is uh, Apache identity for those shipped into places like the mining towns of Mexico persisted longer than we might think. Um, so in part, this was especially true when there was a significant volume, a significant number um, of captives from a particular group sent to a town, then they often forged relationships with each other in that town and that kind of identity persisted. Um, uh, and, um, but, you know, by later in the 19th century and so on, generally you wouldn't see people still um, identifying as pa Apaches in those places. I think today you do see more people kind of recovering an Apache identity. In some cases, this is through genealogy where they find evidence of uh, an Apache captive um, as a part of their family history. Sometimes it has to do with family stories that were passed down that they're kind of rediscovering or thinking about in a new way. Um, so I've definitely met a fair number of people who um, identify as having Apache ancestry or some kind of Apache identity and it's based on this history of, of captivity. For Cuba, um, there's at least one individual <laughs> that I have in mind who I've spoken with, uh, whose family comes from you know, uh, Apaches sent to Cuba, and then um, in the 20th century, they uh, uh, moved to Florida um, in the Castro era and so on. Um, but they retained the story of, a, of an Apache woman in their ancestry. Um, and he contacted me and said, is this right? Uh, could this have happened? And, um, he was very happy that I could say, yes, uh, there's a lot of evidence that that would make sense. Did the indigenous tribes have any presence or effect on the Texas Revolution, Santa Ana's campaign and defeat in 1836? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. So. Uh, Native people in the Texas Revolution. Um, I, I think that in terms of a, my immediate answer is that in terms of kind of du direct participation, um, I don't see a large, a large impact. But in terms of the broader context, the Native presence is absolutely essential. Um, so um, the, um, of, you know, for example, um, one of the, the main reasons why Mexico opens the, its immigration policy, so to speak, to invite in Anglos 
is because of concern about the ability to control and integrate these northern territories that are actually primarily controlled still by Native Americans. Um, so that's, that, that would be my, my short answer is that um, in the broader context, we have absolutely Native American history and what's going on with Natives is, is key to the, the dynamics. Um, but in terms of the actual revolution itself, um, it's not as much so. I know it's pretty complex, but could you just touch upon like linguistics or even origin of Native Americans uh, like Lambridge or from Asia or whatever? Uh, I know there's not a lot of written history. Uh, yeah, language. Um, so that's a great question. I mean, there's um, hundreds of indigenous languages in the Americas. Um, what might be interesting um, for you, to your question is, so Apache speak, you know, in the same way that, you know, in European languages, there's different language families, the Romance languages, Germanic languages that are related to each other in some way. Um, uh, Apaches uh, speak an Athabascan language, um, and there are native peoples who speak Athabascan languages in Northern California, and also then in Northern Canada. Um, and so linguists point to that as evidence of, you know, migrations in the past, right? At some point in time, these people, this language came from, you know, a, a distant common ancestral language, right? And so the fact that there would be related languages in these distant locations suggests that there were migrations um, from north to south um, historically. Um, quickly, you know, the Udo Aztecan language is another language family. Um, that there's speakers of Udo Aztecan languages in present day Nevada and also then in central Mexico. Um, that also suggests, you know, migrations over time. Right here. I had a uh, research specific question. When you are looking into the archives, how difficult is it to find this community? Um, and then how, re how heavily did you rely upon oral interviews? That's a great question. Um, so in, in the more distant past, so thinking of like 17th century, and I was very interested in trying to make sense of, you know, what was the experience of native people, you know, shipped far from home into these communities? What was their daily life like? What kind of communities did they form? It's challenging to do, but the, the way that I did that was through a combination of Catholic church records and paying attention especially to relationships like who are their godparents, right? Um, who are the, um, who sometimes the Catholic church records will even say, you know, the wedding, for example, was attended by these mem you know, the, the, a large number of people in the community or even less specific people attending. So that can give you a way to understand, you know, what is their community? Who are they interacting with? Um, the other thing is um, criminal records and court cases are often a, a kind of source material in which um, captive, you know, exploited people will be called on to testify. Um, and that can also then give you some insight into household dynamics and so on. Um, then for, um, in terms of later time periods that I also wrote about, um, oral histories were very important. Um, I relied a lot upon um, their, um, er so early anthropologists were very interested in trying to save or salvage native cultures before they changed. But as a part of that effort, um, some anthropologists collected a lot of um, autobiographical narratives from Apache people. Um, uh, and I, I use those a lot to try to understand their perspective in their interactions with the United States. Sorry, I move my hands too much. Um, <laughs> their perspectives with the United States, their experiences. The United States takes Apache peoples as prisoners of war to Florida and Alabama and elsewhere. So to understand what was that like, uh, what was their experience like in, for that history, I was able to rely a lot upon Apache's own perspectives. Dr. Conrad, we have two more questions. I'm, I'm over here. Um, <laughs> just curious, um, when you were mentioning about the friars uh, and the, the Catholic records of the, um, like, baptisms and such, and then you were mentioning about taking them, in, enslaving them, or taking them down to work into the coal mines and such, um, I know that in, in California history, the Padres' purpose was to turn them all into Catholics and have them make um, 
little communities in California. And the, the soldiers' purposes were to, had a different purpose. So my, my question about Texas history is the friar's purpose was to baptize them and turn them into Catholics. Who's, whose purpose was it to enslave them and take them down and turn them into sellable commodities? Um, who, were, were there two, two factions working? Yeah, in Texas. Yeah, so that's a good question. So um, what the one thing to keep in mind, I guess, is that you know part of the argument in terms of why it was a allowed to take Apaches and send them so far away and force them to work was the idea that they had um, resisted missionization. So the idea was if you're not willing to settle down and live in a mission, then it's fair game to round you up and ship you south. And the idea was, once you're in a Spanish household, then they will Christianize you. Um, so the justification for enslavement was basically that, well, yes, we're going to benefit from their labor, but also we're supposed to then teach them about Catholicism and Christianize them. So that can seem strange in the sense that you're used to, well, it's missionaries and friars who are educating and Christianizing. But in this dynamic, for groups like the Apache that had resisted missions, the idea ended up being that that's something that can happen in Spanish homes, and those the, the, the masters of those households will be charged with Christianizing the captives that then will, they'll also benefit from having that labor in their homes. Um, so um, it's an interesting history. I see you have a, <laughs> you have a kind of confused look, um, but that was, the, that was kind of the premise of, the, that, of why this, you know, what was in theory going on here with capturing Apaches, sending them south. Um, there was still a dimension of Christianization with it, but it was just not being conducted by friars, by missionaries, it was being conducted by the individual Spanish subjects in their own homes. We have time for one more quick question. When you, <clears throat> when you talk about the Apache, are you particularly talking about uh, different tribes? Uh, some of the research I've done in my family, uh, they specifically, uh, the documentation that we have is the Lipan uh, Native Americans, and they seem to be thrown in with the, the, the Apache, which seems to come from the northern part of Texas. So that, that would be uh, one question. The other question I would have is, is there anything being done on the Mexican side? Because the Lipan existed on, on both sides of the Rio Grande. And, uh, but that's my, t my two question. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for your question. So um, ab absolutely, there's a difference. So it's, I, I wouldn't distinguish that there's Lepons and then there's Apaches. There's Lepons, there's Mescaleros, there's Chiricahuas, there's, you know, so um, there's a range of groups that sometimes had relationships with each other, sometimes they intermarried and so on. Um, there's also, uh, it's comp I, I don't want to get too into the weeds, but even you know some of these you know how how we arrived at these categories like Lepan was based on uh, histories of migration and interaction and so on. Um, but you're absolutely right that there's different Apache groups, so I I don't want to say that they're all one and the same. Um, you're all, also absolutely right to point out that some so like Lepan also for Chiricahuas, there's a long history of relationships. Of, of homelands in Mexico. Um, and um, so, uh, yes, that's something that, that um, I think there's historical research that's being done. There's also important work just in terms of with, with the communities um, and with people doing their own genealogies and so on like you uh, to recover some of that history and understand um, understand the history of Apaches, not only just in the what's now the US, but also in Mexico as well. Thank you, Dr. Conrad.